Thank you all for being here. Of course, I'll be watching you on the restream and over at the Rumble Rants. Uh, today, it's Dr. Michael Turner and, of course, Dr. Kelly Victory here with me as well. Dr. Turner is a board-certified physician, graduate of Stanford and Harvard. I believe his medical school training was at Harvard. Uh, physical medicine, rehabilitation doctor, as well as regenerative medicine. He, let's see, Stanford undergraduate, Harvard Medical School. That is correct. And uh, residency at the Mayo Clinic. So he is well-trained. He uh, dared to use a little improvisational medicine when he was approaching some patients. And for that, his license is being challenged by his state medical board. And he is suing along with three other, I believe, with three other physicians who are in a similar situation. We're going to talk about that with Dr. Turner. You can follow his on his website, michaelturnermd.com. Substack is drturner underscore substack.com. And Instagram is Dr. Michael Turner MD. Let's get to it. Our laws, as it pertains to substances, are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell do you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it. I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. I think everyone knows the next medical crisis could be just around the corner, whether it comes in the form of another pandemic or something much more routine like a tick bite. You and your family need to be prepared. That's where the wellness company comes in. You know the wellness company. We have their physicians on like Dr. McCullough frequently. The wellness company and their doctors are medical professionals you can trust. And their new medical emergency kits are the gold standard when it comes to keeping you safe and healthy. It's really, it's a safety net. It's an insurance policy yeah, absolutely. that you hope you're not going to need, but if you need it, you sure as heck are going to wish you had it if you need it. Be ready for anything. This medical emergency kit contains an assortment of life-saving medications, including ivermectin, z -Pak. The medical emergency kit provides a guidebook to aid in the safe use of all these life-saving medications. From anthrax to tick bites, to COVID-19, the Wellness Company's Medical Emergency Kit is exactly what you need to have on hand to be prepared. Rest assured, knowing that you have emergency antibiotics, antivirals, and antiparasitics on hand to help you and your family stay safe from whatever life throws at you next. Go to drdrew.com slash TWC, that is drdrew.com forward slash TWC to get 10% off today. Just click on that link. Welcome, everyone. As I said, we'll have Dr. Kelly Victory in here in just mere moments. Uh, and for now, we are introducing Dr. Michael Turner, who's going to tell It's when I was on call, I'd pull out, you know, my vitamin C, my ashwagandha, my ginkgo, whatever, take my supplements, right? I was a guy, when I was on call in the hospital, I was doing yoga in the break room, you know, doing some up dog, down dog, side plank, whatever, just stretching. And I never felt like I had to be limited by what I was learning in those... Uh, institutions as august and venerable and fantastic as they are. I never felt like I was limited to that. I felt like my job was ethically to respond to the patient with whatever the best stream of information would be. If it means you need to get an MRI, then that's great. If it means you need to put blueberries in your smoothie because they're good for cognition, then that's great, right? If it means you need to take ginkgo biloba because it improves cerebral blood flow, if it means you're overdue for colonoscopy for colon cancer screening, whatever it is, my job was to pull the best piece of information and provide it to the patient. So I had that mindset as I went through. I was tremendously well-trained on all the traditional sides of medicine, but unfortunately, a lot of the more naturalistic or holistic aspects were self-taught, uh, self-motivated, you know, continuing education courses mm -hmm. and such. But as I then finished so up let, at the let Mayo me, Clinic, Let me, I want to stop you if you don't mind. Yeah. Right there. So, so your postgraduate training was in physical and rehabilitation medicine, correct? Is that accurate? Yes. At Mayo? Yes, exactly. Okay. Yes. And so were you doing the traditional path then of stroke patients and post hips and, you know, post acute hospitalization stuff, or was there something else going on? Yes, traditional. So I got recruited by a hospital here in Washington state to work in an outpatient neuroscience center. So I was doing a lot of mm -hmm. neuroscience mm -hmm. rehab, uh, also mixing in a bit of orthopedic mm -hmm. rehab with that. But I had my interest in integrative okay. medicine and wellness all along. And that actually, we could talk about it, but turned out to force me into a career change because I just felt boxed in essentially at the hospital. And, and then you, you, the, you 
uh, am I correct that you have another board certification in integrative medicine? Is that true? To the extent no, that there is no. such a thing? Yeah, no. there are some accrediting is there such organizations. A thing? I, yeah. I don't know Go if ahead. it's yeah, I don't know if, to what level it's it's risen um, in terms of being an okay. official subspecialty or something like that. But there are certain certification okay. programs. Okay. No, I'm not board certified in integrative medicine, but I use that title because it uh, the title of integrative medicine because it most aptly describes what I do essentially. Okay, and would it be accurate to say that you know the the I don't know how to frame this in a way that's accurate that that the evidence basis for a lot of the recommendations in integrative medicine these days has risen to a standard of evidence-based practices would it be accurate to have said that said it that way that there's oh this is not 1980s like when kelly and i were training when there was almost no it was the wild west but now there's a lot of when, when i you know for instance when i talk about a supplement i and the first thing i ask for is get me the data and there's usually a whole stream of good studies that they can provide for me so is is it accurate to say that the evidence basis for your recommendations is 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 up to a, a reasonable standard of of quality now certainly uh i pride myself on that i try to be evidence-based in everything that i do you know and because that's my integrity and that's also the patient's time and energy and money and health risk, right? I don't want to be chasing every bandwagon or some MLM scheme or something I read about on the internet. I have to recommend it in a good mm -hmm. conscience. But you know what's interesting? A lot yeah. of things that used to be considered alternative medicine are now very mainstream. For example, right. vitamin, that's right. vitamin D, right? Vitamin D is a great example. That is, is vitamin mm -hmm. D alternative medicine? It's gotten more and more mainstream. The literature is off the charts in terms of what it does to the immune system, musculoskeletal mm -hmm. health, mm -hmm. et cetera. And so now it's almost mainstream. You know, your primary care should check a vitamin D level just like he or she should check a cholesterol, right? Um, it, another it's example. True. I do do that. I, I, I'm a primary care guy and I, I do that all the time now. A and there's even some other sort of interesting uh, data on vitamin D sprinkled throughout. For instance, it's one of the only things that is shown to do the, if um, I state this accurately as I can, decrease the risk of progressive metastasis in outside the capsule disease of prostate cancer. It's kind of interesting. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I know yeah. I know it has yeah. striking so, anti-cancer properties. Absolutely. Yeah. So, all right. So you're in regenerative medicine. How long have you been in that field? Um, basically since 2009, uh, I was working at the hospital, but doing a lot of integrative medicine sort of within that job, right? Mm -hmm. So patients would come to me for their mm -hmm. back pain or their post-surgical rehab. But then they would also have complaints like, I don't have enough energy, or I want to lose weight, or I wonder what my thyroid's doing. So me trying to pull together mm -hmm. integrative solutions goes back to the beginning of my career in 2009, but really jumped off in 2020 when I went into business for myself. Okay. And then COVID hits. Uh, and what, what did you think of that whole experience? Forget what your, the fall that was for you. As it hit, what were the kinds of thoughts you had as we walked into this extraordinary th circumstance? Yeah, well, first of all, bewilderment, um, desperation. <laughs> <laughs> I had all those. Yeah, sounds about right. Right? Uh, uh, desperation, yeah. you know, strong drive to figure out an answer, right? I had patients calling me. Yeah. I don't want to get this. I heard it's pretty bad. I got grandma or somebody in the hospital. You know, how do I prevent mm -hmm. this? Which was my first question. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to prevent it? And then came the early treatment questions. I'm coughing. My SATs aren't great. I don't want to go to the ER. You know, what do I do? Or somebody went to the hospital, got remdesivir and didn't come out. I don't want to be that person. What do I do? And sometimes people mm -hmm. coughing and being quite acutely ill on the other side of the telemedicine visit. So it was like my time to rise to the occasion. I felt like, you know, now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of their country kind of a concept. So it was our time as healthcare providers. This is what we're trained to do. We need to step up. Well, I think, you know, you're in good company here with myself and Dr. Victory. We sort of had the similar kind of feeling like what, what is going on? The, now you've got to stand up and ask questions. Uh, it's just kind of a scary circumstance, but, uh, you know, like, like I said, I don't know if you got to see that there's a little stream we play ahead of the show. I was in this particular when I was interviewing uh, Megan Kelly and I said, you know, I felt like I was part of the French underground. We were talking, you know, we were sending out information that was forbidden just to ask questions about what is going on here. And so you ended up uh, getting into the early treatment world, I guess, or offering early treatment. 
uh, one of the cases went bad, and you have now a situation with the medical board. Tell me about that. Sure. Well, I got into early treatment uh, through utilization of the FLCCC protocols, which were game changing for me, saved a lot of patients' lives. Uh, most assuredly, people come back and tell me that. I kept a lot of people out of the hospital. Um, and, you know, things were going swimmingly. And then some anonymous complaints would have started to be filed, which is interesting. You mentioned a case gone bad. A case never really went bad. Um, I'm under investigation for a few things, but not, not any of them relate to a case going bad. The case that went bad, quote unquote, mm. in the eyes of the medical commission is a gentleman who had very severe COVID. I did everything I could to help him, including ivermectin, including other appropriate forms of medical care. He unfortunately died of COVID several days uh, later in the hospital. And they tried mm. to pin my use of ivermectin as being causal in some of the pathophysiology that led to his death. I would more aptly say that he I just see. died of severe COVID. Uh, and unfortunately, right, I right. couldn't help him with what I did, right? Um, that's the most sort of egregious you know, or aggressive concept that the, the state has. Other than that, it's simply people... Basically, they're prosecuting me for violating their COVID misinformation statement, which your, I, your producer may be able to pull up for us. But it, they passed this statement, similar to what they did in California, which you're very familiar. You may want to talk to that uh, point. They passed the same thing in Washington, right? Here it is, COVID misinformation statement. And right in there, it says, um, you know, physicians who generate and spread, quote unquote, COVID-19 misinformation or disinformation erode the public trust in the medical profession and endanger patients. Okay, well, fair enough. That sounds all good, but let's go figure out how do you define that, right? And they go down a little bit farther, and here's kind of the kicker. It says the WMC, which relies on, uh, which stands for Washington Medical Commission, relies on the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approval of medications to treat COVID-19 to be, quote, the standard of care. Interesting. Wow, Next I guess sentence. we can't use the vaccine then. We can't use the vaccine then, can we? Isn't I know, isn't that funny? Because you know what else was not approved by the FDA? The vaccine. <laughs> <laughs> Why yeah. wasn't that on here? Yeah. In fact, Dr. Drew, yeah. I'm going to, thank you for mentioning it. I'm going to put on my In fact, in fact well, hang on a second, Michael. You're not able to use aspirin or Tylenol ever because those aren't FDA approved treatments of anything ever. <laughs> Good point. I've got, right? a, I've got a COVID test kit right here. Binax now. All right, I... I yeah. I, I bought this thing from CVS the other day. Drew, you're going to get kicked out of this. Here's what it says. This product has not been FDA cleared or yep. approved, but right. has been authorized by the FDA under an emergency youth authorization. EUA. So yeah. right. there we this thing EUA. is not FDA approved yeah. either. This should be on their misinformation right. statement. Why are we allowing people to take this terrible stuff? It's not FDA approved. Uh, the Since when does the FDA, this is the thing I can't get people to understand. I was doing a nightly newscast um, here locally, trying to help people make sense of COVID and stuff. And the anchor, who's a great guy, and we had a great relationship, and he started going, well, what about what the FDA is telling you to do? And I go, the FDA can't tell me anything. The FDA has nothing to do with the practice of medicine. Literally nothing. Except... It tells companies that are bringing medical products to market how they can market them. That's it. Right. That is the other than that, I can do anything that is in the best interest of the patient. And if you want to talk right. about misinformation, I mean, you know, Dr. Walensky talked about stopping the spread of COVID. And then she went, oh, no, no, we can't stop the spread of COVID. Well, which was the misinformation? Back and forth. Misinformation is one of the most egregious terms did, did you had you ever heard of misinformation before 2020 in the practice no. of medicine in 40 years no. i practice not a word that no. it, we talked about disagreements we talked about alternative opinions we talked about alternative right. practices but but we did not talk about misinformation this is the idea that science has misinformation no i i reject that completely completely galileo galileo was presenting misinformation in the eyes of the Spanish Inquisition and the Pope. That was misinformation. So where do we stop, everybody? Who decides what you can and can't talk about with your patients? This is insanity. I hope you have good lawyers that can scream about it the way I'm screaming about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Drew. I appreciate the passion. I do. I've got some great lawyers. I agree. Um, you know, Here's what's interesting. How can you have immediately a standard of care First of all, by the FDA, which has got nothing to do with anything, because as you said, they don't have the mandate anything. nor the authority 
nor the expertise Anything. to determine whether a particular patient should get a particular medication at a particular point in time. Nothing. That's called medical decision making. Way, That's why you by, by the way, if they ever if they ever do uh, sort of uh, claim that privilege, well, now we can sue the shit out of them when they make mistakes. So good on them for getting into this practice with us. It's it's hard work. Enjoy it. <laughs> so go ahead, keep going. Sure, no problem. But. Apart from that, let's say you had organization of doctors X, Y, Z that said this is a standard of care and what you're doing is outside of that. It's misinformation. I just I have to ask a question, yeah. right? Critical thinking. How can you have a standard of care so quickly in the midst of a novel and evolving pandemic that I the know. world has never seen? I agree. I mean, come on. And, and, you know, and it, by the way, yeah, I agree. And, and by the way, if, if uh, people, you know, I've always felt like the professional societies could get involved with this, right? I mean, your uh, your physical rehabilitation, uh, I'm sure you're part of some professional society with mm -hmm. that. If they want to yeah. ask questions, they're, they're entitled to ask questions. I, I think that's a reasonable, but that, those organizations don't seem to have gotten involved with any of this because they know how challenging this all is. I, so I'm, I, go ahead, finish your thoughts, then we're going to bring Dr. Victory in here. Oh, go ahead. Sure, yeah, I appreciate it. Well, my other thought was, to say that ivermectin is not FDA approved to treat COVID is really to say nothing. It's it's an absurd statement on many levels, right? Because let's just ask the question, how, how could it have been even FDA approved, right? I mean, the FDA approval process takes time. It takes money. It takes years. So here we are into a novel pandemic. Who has studied ivermectin for years that has gone through the full FDA regulatory process to get FDA approval? And who would be willing to bankroll it since it's a generic medication? Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it, it, of course, it wasn't FDA approved. That was it's a kind of a nonsensical statement. The question is, does it work? Yeah. And was it plausibly yeah. helpful to keep your patients from going to the hospital and dying? You know, it's it's kind of funny. I use example. Let's say there was a raging wildfire sweeping through your community. Right. And you got in your car and you punched it and your car was up to 100 miles an hour and it was getting near the red zone. Right. This would be like saying, oh, the National Highway Safety Administration has not approved your car to drive at 100 miles an hour for more than five minutes at a time. Right, that's right. right. You're like, that's right. Yep. okay, but uh, it might, and I need to go for it right now, and I don't have time for these people to rule on something that they don't have the situational awareness to talk well, to me about anyway. No, you're right, and, and listen, I was saying that if nothing else, I'm sure, you know, once you prescribe to somebody sick, you you, it, you follow up carefully. And one of the things that was not happening during COVID was people were told just, you know, take an O2 finger monitor, go home, come back when it's 87. That is not yeah. medicine. I don't know what that is, as opposed to I'm going to give you something, Tylenol, you know, and then let's talk in 24 hours and 48 hours and see how things right. are going. Uh, the, the, we, we, I don't know, maybe it's that we... When we prescribe, we follow more carefully, I think, perhaps, or we're, we're involved in the treatment of the patient at that point, and it changes our follow-up practices a little bit. We were doing the opposite of that during COVID. We were, so I wonder sometimes if just the act of you know, being engaged with the patient therapeutically was enough to monitor them more carefully and keep people out of trouble just by itself. I mean, I'm, I'm prepared to say that. But anyway, let, let, let's stop right there. Uh, I want to bring Dr. Victory in. I've, I've used up all my time by myself with you here. Uh, let's see. Is there any place you want to send people? Before to, how about michaelturnermd.com if you want more information? And the substack is... Uh, Dr. Turner underscore subscat dot com dot com. We're gonna take a little break. We're gonna do some business, and we're bring Dr. Kelly Victory in here. Susan and I have been looking for nutrition pack, great tasting greens drink for a while, and then we tried our friends at Paleo Valley's organic super greens, which is superior to what's out there on the market. Our friends at Paleo Valley, well, they think of everything, and they've created what's been called a magical green powerhouse. All three delicious varieties. Pure, unflavored, strawberry lemonade and tropical contain 23 certified organic antioxidant-rich superfoods, including the highest quality spirulina. It's also free of cereal grasses, gluten, grains, soy, and dairy, and no added sugars or artificial sweeteners. And what's more, it delivers digestive enzymes, polyphenols, which are believed to burn fat, and eight essential amino acids. Imagine the time, effort, and cost of trying to make this yourself. It's impossible. Head on over to drdrew.com slash paleovalley, and you will get 15% off your first order. All the great products they have there, 15% off 
at drdrew.com slash paleo, P-A-L-E-O. Fall is right around the corner, which means dry, flaky red skin from allergy season is coming with it. But the best way to take care of your skin is with our skincare secret, Genucel. You don't need to worry about that puffy, tired eye look or those annoying dark spots or even dry flaky skin because Genucel skincare has you covered. Susan and I love our Genucel products so much, we want you to try our personally curated skincare bundles. It's risk-free at genucel.com slash Drew. Genucel works so well, you can see the results in this unplanned live moment on our show when the Redness Repair Cream repaired my skin in just minutes right before your eyes. Their concentrated vitamin C serum helps keep your skin plump and hydrated. Plus, with their immediate effects, you can see astonishing results in under 12 hours. Quick, effective, and easy. Go to genucel.com slash Drew right now to try our bundles and save over 60% today. And remember to enroll in Genucel's world-class concierge program for additional savings and free shipping. Don't wait. It's genucel.com slash Drew, G-E-N-U-C-E-L dot com slash D-R-E-W. These products have transformed my life and Susan's and saved her marriage. Discover the key to oral hygiene, regardless of your current daily dental routine. Whether you diligently brush and floss multiple times a day, or you struggle, you got bleeding gums, bad breath, plaque buildup, this revelation is for both of you. Surprisingly, over 350,000 Americans experience health issues that may be connected to their toothbrush or even caused by it, ranging from heart or blood sugar problems, forgetfulness, digestive difficulties, immune issues, all related to oral hygiene. Scientific studies have shown that a simple switch of your toothbrush can lead to a healthier teeth and potentially save your marriage. Yes, Save your marriage. Our study, we did a personal study. My wife, Susan, hates the sound of the sonic toothbrushes, but introducing the real white sonic toothbrush, of course, also their hydroxyapatite dirty mouth mineral toothpaste by Primal Life Organics, these products have transformed my life and Susan's and saved her marriage. It's much quieter. It's a very powerful toothbrush, but it is quiet and it saved our marriage. So, The Real White Sonic Toothbrush from Primal Life Organics stands out among all other electric toothbrushes I've tried. It effectively eliminates plaque, harmful bacteria, promotes gum health. Get yours and enjoy 60% off at naturaltoothbrush.com slash DREW. Some platforms have banned the discussion of controversial topics. If this episode ends here, the rest of the show is available at drdrew.tv. There's nothing in medicine that doesn't boil down to a risk-benefit calculation. It is the mandate of public health to consider the impact of any particular mitigation scheme on the entire population. This is uncharted territory, Drew. Dr. Victory, I've had my fun with Dr. Turner. Now I turn him to you. (laughs) Michael, great to see you. I'm so glad to get in here with my hair on fire. You guys got your hair on fire really early on. I got to, you know, get in here too. Normally we wait a little later in the show until we get quite so fired up. Um, I want to give a little bit of backstory here. Uh, Dr. Turner and I met Drew at a recent conference up in Spokane, Washington, where uh, we were both speaking to a group of people a medical freedom conference conference um, and, and it before it's a group in a group of physicians nurses nurse practitioners physical therapists uh, pharmacists all of whom who have uh, decided to really get out of the system um, because of the perverse incentives of the mm-hmm. system and the algorithmic thinking and the pressures to behave in a certain way um, I think that this covid debacle frankly, has fueled what this what was sort of an underground movement for a while. And I think that what we've seen in the last three years has added tremendous energy to this movement where people are saying, see, th- this is why I want out. And I, uh, I really want to spend some time getting into the weeds with you, uh, Michael, with regard to treatment and the use of um, what they are calling sort of repurposed drugs and then get into that. But before I do, I really want you to take a few minutes and go back because there's a part of your story that I don't think we, we fully expose to our audience, which is the egregious nature to which you were 
persecuted. And you were. And many of us, by the way, it, it was sort of an informal competition at that conference in Spokane. Uh, people saying how many how many complaints they had had filed against them and how many, you know, I've had seven and Mary Talley Bowden had had five and other people have had, you know, we were comparing how many people have been uh, attacked. But you had a story that I found particularly heinous with regard to what the board did in terms of trying to fundamentally assist people in, in filing complaints against you. So just talk a little bit more about what happened and then what you did, where you ended up going and working, what you've been doing, where you've been practicing. Yeah, sure. Well, thank you, Kelly. <clears throat> I think it dates back greatly to a TV article that, or a TV report that was done. So one day I was in clinic and uh, my secretary said, hey, there's a reporter here who wants to talk to you. She left, but here's her business card. This was a Friday afternoon. Uh, I had a busy clinic the rest of the day. So I figured I'll call this person back on Monday and I'll get my side of the story, whatever the story is. I don't even know what it's going to be, right? That night I'm at the gym and my phone is just blowing up. It's ringing off the hook. And I was working as an independent contractor leasing a space in a larger clinic. And this was the owner of the larger clinic. He's like, your name's all over the paper. Our clinic name's all over the uh, news rather. What's going on? What's this deal? Are you prescribing ivermectin? I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. I am prescribing ivermectin, but news story, I have no idea what you're talking about. I mean, a reporter dropped her card off. I don't know. Is, is that what you're talking about? He's like, go check the news out, right? So I went on the news and they aired this pre-packaged hit piece is the only way to characterize it about ivermectin saying, oh, poison control calls are up and it's veterinary medicine and it's horse pace. And they literally had cutaways to horses in stalls and then cutaways to very concerned looking news anchors and then cut away to a Washington state public health official saying by no means should any human being be getting ivermectin. That's a ridiculous you know, concept. And then Dr. Turner couldn't be reached for comment. And then by the way, <laughs> if, you want, <laughs> if you want to file a complaint and you think there's been a violation of the standard of care, you know, here's where you do it. And they published the phone number. And this, this also was in their print piece. And so it was kind of a very unfair in my mind characterization and a takedown piece with this blatant you know, invitation to click this link and call this number to file a complaint. Well, not surprisingly, I had a number of complaints roll in over the next six months. But here's what was curious. None of the complaints were actually from people I treated. None. Nobody said, oh, Dr. Turner treated me. He didn't do a good job. You know, he was hasty. He didn't talk to me. He didn't follow up. Nobody said that. Right. Nobody's close family even said that, that he didn't take good care. The complaints would come from like an ER doctor who had an incoming patient and they noticed that they were prescribed ivermectin and they did a little sleuthing and found out that Turner prescribed ivermectin. And then they pulled up the Washington state misinformation statement, which we just read and said, voila, I'm going to report him. Right. Or it'd be from somebody's distant relative, like an aunt who was a nurse and the nurse thought that, you know, her relative should not be subjected to the hands of somebody so irresponsible and ridiculous as to give them ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine. I must report him. Those were the context of the reports, it, honestly. Yeah, and that is what that is 100% consistent, by the way, with my own experience. Not one of my complaints was from a patient, not one. It all had to do with things that I said on air things that either that I said on radio or television or wrote in uh, op-ed pieces in the in the newspaper. Not one was a patient complaint and they all were uh, done anonymously. Same thing with Mary Talley Bowden and all of the other physicians and clinicians who I spoke to at that conference who had complaints against them. These were not complaints to the medical board in the way we normally expect, where a patient is saying, I went to see Dr. You know, Dr. Turner or Dr. Victory and this is how I was mistreated, and I think the board needs to investigate. So I think people really need to understand that, that, that physicians are being attacked, but we are being set up with these hit pieces uh, in, in a way that is, has never happened before in the history uh, of, of medicine. I've got a couple decades on you, and I can tell you, uh, it yeah. has never happened before, Dr. Turner. Now, Make a segue, if you would, to talk briefly about then where you went after that. How did that, uh, cl you were renting space or leasing space in a larger clinic. What was their response and where did you go? Well, interesting, you know, so the owner of the clinic was quite irate, um, exercised, you know, would be a fair word. I had to talk him down a little bit. We had a meeting of the minds. Um, interestingly enough, 
I was still open to the vaccine at that time and I was pro vaccine and I had actually been vaccinated and that kind of helped smooth the waters a little bit. He's like, well, you're not anti-vax, are you? I'm like, no, I just got the Pfizer, you know, last month. So he, that bought me a little bit of room in his mind that I wasn't a wackadoo that needed to be, you know, disassociated from immediately, <laughs> thankfully. And so he actually took out a position that I respect very much. He uh, prepped his staff. They came out and they made a public statement that said, Dr. Turner's an independent contractor, rent space in our clinic. He's free to treat patients as he sees fit. We don't see that he's done anything wrong. And so we, I stayed there for another year, actually, entirely. So that, that ended up working out all right. Um, but to your point about the investigations, you know, what's interesting, too, is they would say, OK, send, they would subpoena all these documents, essentially, and say, send me all the records for this patient. I'd send them all in. Then I would not hear anything from them. Months would go by. No response. And then I'd get another one. Oh, there's been a complaint about patient so-and-so. Send us all the information. Again, no response. These things would stack up. They would give you no response. And then when they did respond, they would, it's like tentacles. They would keep asking for other things that weren't really even relevant. And so at one point, my lawyer's like, we're not giving you any more documents. We're going to have our day in court. Like, let's adjudicate this matter. But you beating us over the head endlessly with requests for documents is not a game that we're going to play anymore. And I thank him for having the chutzpah to do that, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think another thing I want to interject here, and I hope it's not lost on, on our audience, is when I sit here talking to you, you're Stanford trained, Harvard trained. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm Duke trained, uh, went to Oxford. Uh, you, for Drew, it's, you know, Amherst and USC. You know, not exactly, the, you know, we didn't exactly go to, you know, uh, make a wish programs, on, you know, on the back of a matchbook <laughs> cover. Um, truly, I mean, you look at the people who we have on this show, whether it's uh, Peter McCullough or, you know, Jay Bhattacharya from Stanford, you know, people from, you know, Oxford, uh, you know, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, Princeton. We, we, these are some of, you know, the most preeminent universities in the country. We are all to a person extraordinarily well-trained, highly educated, well-trained. Um, we are not a bunch of wackadoos. Um, we are all doing what I and you, and I know from my extensive conversations with you, Michael, have what we were trained to do, which is critical thinking, to actually do decision-making, to be capable of inductive and deductive reasoning, and to apply what we've learned clinically and apply it to the individual patient. Somewhere along the line, and this is what I'm most interested in right now, somewhere along the line, we want to stray, and that has fallen by the wayside, not just in medicine, by the way. Uh, critical thinking is absent, is AWOL in a lot of parts of our society, but certainly um, a, very obvious in medicine. Talk a little bit about that piece, and I'd like to hear your thoughts about that and, and hear what your experience was with your coworkers, colleagues, with regard to what you were choosing to do, thinking, I don't even think outside the box, I just think thinking, you know, critically. Yeah, good point. I'll, glad to do so. Well, <clears throat> um, you know, the critical thinking is so necessary. We must preserve that role as somebody who's independent and has the patient's best interests in mind and their sole interests in mind. Right. And I'm very motivated by a quote from William Mayo, one of the co-founders of the Mayo Clinic. And he said, the best interests of the patient are the only interests to be considered. Right. And that's part of what made Mayo Clinic great. And I respect them very much. And I had a great education there. And I carry that forward. But what that means now is you also have to get your critical thinking cap on. Right. The best interests of the patient are the only interests to be considered, not the political pronouncements of the FDA not the political position of some current administration, not what the Washington state governor says, what's in the best interest of the patient. And the problem is that the doctor, the healthcare practitioner is typically operating at the underside of a big, large structure, this massive pyramid, right? right that's very conflicted, that has heavy ties into pharma and insurance and the federal government because federal government through Medicare is the biggest insurer. You, you know this, we could talk about these kind of mm -hmm. things, but essentially, We've lost the voice and the space to be the unbiased guardian of the patient's best interests. We are at our worst now just seen as uh, slavishly obedient or um, enactors of larger policy interests that many times collide with the patient. And that's where we have to stand up and take our stand. But we can't many times in these structures. 
It's a big, big problem. We've got to get unconflicted there, Kelly. We've got to break away or we lose what's at the heart of healthcare. This is vital. This is way bigger than ivermectin. This is way bigger than COVID. This is about when I go see my doctor, can I trust him or her to think about me and me only and me first? Or are they thinking about prosecution from their state political commission of God knows what or, or I, FDA? I actually, knows what? I, I could not agree more strongly with Michael. I really think we need to come up with systems of delivery outside of the traditional systems, like well, some other well, models that physicians that yeah. who can use their brain still and are willing to do so and are properly trained to do so can represent the patient exactly as Dr. Turner is suggesting, Kelly. Well, Drew, no, Drew, that's exactly what this conference was about because I would submit to you, you work for whoever pays you. That's it's a fact. And 80% of physicians are employees of large hospital systems, Crazy. large medical groups, or insurance companies. You work for who pays you, which means if you are employed by a large hospital system or an, a physician group or an insurance company, you are not working for the patient. You may say that you are, yeah. but you're not. You're working for United Healthcare or Anthem or Aetna or Kaiser, whoever's telling you what you're going to do. In the electronic medical record, is part and parcel with this. The electronic medical record is not actually a medical record. It's a billing template that incidentally captures a few pieces of clinical data. That's all it is, okay? I'm sorry, but that is a fact. And the drop down boxes that tell you what you're gonna order and what the order set's gonna be and what prescription you're gonna give. And this is a perfect segue because this is why we have started to call these things, quote, repurposed medications, medicines because the system would like you to use the newfangled medications that make somebody mm -hmm. a lot of money. And it's only if there's nothing else in the expensive bundle of new toys that you can use, that then they will allow you, oh, okay, you can use the one that only costs two cents a pill that we've known about for 50 years. Oh, okay. You know, because they'd rather have you use the other one. I remember I grew up in a big family, big Catholic family. And when we'd wrap presents for Christmas, my mom always wanted us to use the little scraps of, of stuff that was left over, but it was way more fun to pull out a brand new roll of wrapping paper and use that because that's the easier mm -hmm. stuff and it's prettier and no one's used it before. And it's really fun. Shinier. No one wants to use the little scraps that are left over, but those are very valuable. And I'll tell you, in the medical system, this whole thing is corrupt. And so they want you to believe that these other things don't work, like ivermectin or hydroxychloroquine Kelly, or vitamin D. Yeah. But Kelly, th there's a kind of a pernicious element in here that I'd love to see you guys, you two talk about, which is a large number of our peers v feel entitled to centralize the decision making i'm thinking of a friend mm -hmm. of mine that was doing some very creative work with pain management and he was very nearly lost his job and now the protocols he was advocating have become entire west coast wide systems uh protocols because they finally after years of 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 um vilifying this guy and god knows how many patients being improperly served they went oh you have a point now i think of the opioid crisis it with the opioid thing was exactly the precursor to all of this what do we do with our peers who feel a value who feel not just entitled but it's valuable to centralize in these huge bureaucratic systems that i think the three of us believe is anathema to proper care. I mean, this is a worldview issue, right? Their worldview is, I remember I gave, I gave a lecture in Bermuda and I was talking about the over-centralization and how that resulted in so much of the problems with COVID. And I could feel the audience going, like I could feel their muscles tightening up, like, oh, you're, you're against us. We're for these big systems. And I thought, really? How, is that? So help help me you know walk through that. How do we get people back to the basic principles of what Mayo uh, represented and Sir, Sir William Osler represented, and the three of us were trained to represent? I'll throw that to Mike, Doctor Turner. You take take a take a bite at that. Mm. Well, I think it's crucial for us as individual practitioners to reclaim our vision for who we wanted to be and why we went into healthcare in the first place. This is a lot of where it starts, right? Like we, we start, I think, with great motives. We want to be a change agent in the lives of patients. We want them to trust us. We want to work in their best interest. 
and we have this grand vision of who we can be and you know the kinds of effects that we can make so are are you living that out do you feel that in your current structure and system you have the freedom the intellectual freedom the pragmatic freedom to bring that to bear and to make it happen if you don't and you're feeling a little conflicted then there needs to be a change, right? Like it's not enough to just say, well, I've got great benefits and a matching 401k from my hospital and I just don't wanna to make too much noise. It's like, you're, you're violating your conscience and you're not being your best self as a healthcare provider. So if, I think if we roll back okay, and- I'm gonna yeah. interrupt. So, so, to, so you're saying stand up for what's right, which I totally agree with, but what do we do with our peers who believe that what they're doing is right to centralize it the way they have? Well, I guess one thing would be point out the flaws of that, point out where it doesn't work out well. You know, um, it's the conflict between the collective and the individual, it. right? Well, Which right. is a socio-political mm -hmm. concept. But we know we have the Bill of Rights and the Constitution and the idea that the individual has certain inalienable rights. So that extends to the medical realm as well. Um, it can't just be collective uh, good and we ramrod certain medical guidelines down people um you know that we can point out the breakdowns of that philosophically historically even yeah i think michael you just hit the nail the, the core of the uh of my talk about the lack of critical thinking was this pernicious um sort of shift from the individual to the collective everything you know everything fundamentally you know, things like informed consent drew are, are anathema mm -hmm. when you're talking informed consent is based on the individual patient if you now are saying that your individual rights or your individual best interest is supplanted by the by the what's best for society what's best for the community mm -hmm. what's best for the collective yep. this focus all of a sudden on the collective and that's what happened with public health that we have conflated Public health and individual health are very different. I know the difference because I am both. But when I have my individual practitioner hat on, my focus is exactly as Michael said, that individual patient and that individual patient alone, nothing else. When I put my public health hat on, it's very different. I'm now looking at the entire, you know, that the collective. We have conflated the two. And I would submit to you, there's mm -hmm. really very little individual healthcare anymore in individual healthcare you know the fundamental construct of autonomy there is no such thing you know in, in uh in individual healthcare as taking one for the team you know the idea of of you know you should take a vaccine drew and and uh, be subjected to potential risks because it's better for your neighbors sorry yeah. that yeah. that that's not how it works uh it's supposed yeah, to be yeah i think you, you know hear you guys own. talk i I think we are going to have to come up with, we're going to have to outcompete. We're going to have to get like-minded people together that are interested in the individual patient and medical freedom and outcompete. That we might end up with a two, two parallel systems even. But we have to go out there and compete, literally. I think that's, you know, Dr. Turner is young enough that I can still call on him to really go out there and do it. I'm not sure I'm up for it anymore. But, but I think we have to do that. We have an obligation to do that. So, yeah, so talk about that, Michael. What you, you know, you have a lot to say on that topic. I heard an interview with you and uh, Dr. Cat yeah. Lindley, who is a, a friend and a friend of the show, with Del Bigtree talking specifically about that. So, how do you think that we create that parallel system or retake over the individual system? Sure. So, I think on the practitioner side, it's breaking away from insurance. That's the first step. Uh, yes. because as you said, you work for whoever mm -hmm. pays you insurance dictates a bunch of things. In fact, you know, if you're a physician, you're not happy with insurance. It's not a great setup, right? They're, they're in your business. They're yeah. killing you with paperwork. They're mucking around. You don't like them. You want to fire them. Yep. You're just afraid to, because your bottom line, you're, you don't know how, what might happen to your bottom line. Right? So we've got to create some systems that then welcome doctors and say, you know what? You're free of insurance. Come on over here. Let's lose these people. Let's use, lose United and all these other groups and let's make decisions in the best interest of the patient wouldn't actually be hard tons of healthcare providers would flock because you know what tons of healthcare providers are leaving the profession anyway just from pure burnout and dissatisfaction right so we can offer them a better alternative um but on the patient side as well i think it's very compelling you know again you want to if you were if you were going to a financial advisor you wouldn't want you'd want him to be unbiased and looking at your portfolio making right. your best interest right you wouldn't want to hear about all these backroom yeah. conflicts that he's getting paid and kickbacks and yep. you know all this stuff you pay for someone to manage your money expertly and you trust in it 
Same concept. Patients will want that. They'll pay for it all day, left, right, and center. Most of my patients still have primary care who they see through their insurance, but that's sort of like a second level concept to them. They're not greatly attached to that. They're like, yeah, I see my primary care every six months or so, you know, because Medicare makes me and they don't usually have time. They don't answer a lot of questions, whatever. And then I come to you and I pay you cash and I enjoy our conversations because you spend time and you care and you listen and you learn. And you know what? I'll do that. So th they'll pay money because the value is there. Um, and so it's compelling on both sides of the equation. We just have to create that system and welcome everybody in, which is being you done. You know, and in, to be fair, it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's not, you're, we're really talking about, think about it, just to, not to get into the weeds too deeply, but we're really talking about an outpatient system. The inpatient system, which is, you know, potentially financially catastrophic, that can be, that can be still covered by insurance. Right, Insurance Absolutely. is yes. insurance against catastrophe, insurance right. against excess financial burden. And then the actual people that are responsible to keep people out of the hospital can operate completely independently of that. Yeah, when I was growing up, that's what we called major medical. You, you know, we paid our pediatrician mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or our internist cash. You know, we went, we we paid, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're fundamentally self-insured. But then my father carried what we called major medical in case, you know, you you fell off the roof or you had a car accident or you got cancer or whatever. You, you got covered for yeah, that catastrophic yeah. event. But otherwise, you paid for your routine care. Uh, and I think that that's, I was shocked, uh, Michael, to tell you the truth, at the number of people and the amount of energy at that conference that there are that many people and a few by the way drew real success stories of people who are primary care folks who are doing it the good old-fashioned way i mean they have one other person a, generally a front office person not even a nurse we, we had doctors saying i know how to take a blood pressure i know how to ask the patient to stand on the scale that's what i do I know how to Kelly, draw that's, a tube that's of what i've done for years yeah that that's what and, i have done and, for years I, that's how i've done it yeah. and it's you know it's hard to make ends meet and stuff but but i, I mean I, I because i take medicare and insurance and one of the reasons by the way for one thing you guys left out as to why we we listen to the insurance and take the insurance is i don't want the patient to incur a bunch of expense because the insurance all of a sudden says they won't cover something that was necessary that that can get awful i don't think people understand how mm -hmm inexpensive primary care can be it can be very inexpensive it's not a right. costly process right right no uh, so, how do you manage yours michael uh I'm so sorry, i'm cash yeah i'm cash based um it works out well for people i'll to give you an example though the gentleman who spoke at our conference kelly um dr edgerly out of yakima washington mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. look him up he has a so-called direct primary care which is cash-based membership right. It starts at $100 a month and goes down from there with discounts for families. And his guarantee is, I will see you on the same day. If you are sick, you can come and I will see you in person. And then, by the way, he does ultrasounds and x-rays and EKGs at mm -hmm. cost, um, mm -hmm. has a lot of generic mm -hmm. medications at cost. Yakima, Washington is mm -hmm. not a populously thriving, economically vibrant upper class area by any mm -hmm. means. His practice is busting at the seams, expanding all the time because the value there is tremendous. How many people can't even get a call back from their primary care? They can't even get a return phone call or an email or a call back. And then the next visit out is months and months, if anything, yeah, right? And then when they that. get in there, we they're rushed. We can do better that. And you can do better mm -hmm. than that for a hundred bucks a month. Yep. I mean, some people spend more than that at yep. Starbucks. Yep, agreed. Right. No, and, and, and I said, we, you have to be careful. People need to be careful not to conflate the idea of concierge medicine with this direct That's primary different. care. What you're talking about, Michael, is direct primary care, which is back to the way it used to be, where you've got yeah. a physician who takes only cash. And you know, I paid an arm and a leg to sign up for this quote concierge program, which gets me supposedly, you know, preferred appointment times and longer appointment times and things like that. And I'm saying what I want is a doctor who's capable of non-algorithmic thinking. You know, somebody who doesn't give blind deference to authority, somebody who actually thinks out of the box and is willing to listen to my particular concerns and do its best for me. And that's the kind of model you're fair, talking about. So sometimes that's concierge medicine. I don't want to disparage what they, those are people also trying to manage this mess. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I admire yeah. them trying to do it. It's just it's just another model. But if mm -hmm. you're still taking insurance, I would submit to you if you if you're primarily an insurance based model. 
as I said, yeah. I, I will make it, you work for who pays you. And if you're being paid by the insurance company, that's, you know, that's who's, you know, you're, you're dancing to their, to their drum. Um, yes. and I think that's a problem. Yeah. And to, to reiterate your point, Kelly, it's a great point. You know, from the patient side, what you've done when you go see your insurance doctor, when you get insurance, you've essentially outsourced your medical care to the insurance right. company. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. You've outsourced it to them. You say, I pay you and you figure out my insurance, my medical care. And they say, fine, these doctors you can see and these you can't see. And this procedure will pay for mm -hmm. and this we won't. Right. So by the time you go mm -hmm. see your doctor, you think it's just you and the doctor in the room. It's not the, med right. the insurance company sitting right there in the middle of you, like the 500 pound gorilla that nobody wants to talk about. And you've some contracted your care to them. By the way, do you think they have your best interests in mind? Do they have financial conflicts mm -hmm. of interest? Do they have massive lobbying conflicts of interest, right? I mean, why does it make sense that you'd want to subcontract your care to them? And the, the, the problem, the illusion that a lot of patients are under is when they're sitting in there with the doctor, they don't realize all this. And they think that the doctor's just speaking from the heart, truly saying right. what's in their best interest. The doctor's going, I know that this is what insurance will pay for. If I go this other route, it's, I'm going to have to do 58 pieces of paperwork and I don't have time for that. Right. And I got to sign and fill out all these like Medicare ABN forms and a bunch of stuff you and I know. Right. Or I might get sanctioned by the hospital because it's off protocol for what they want. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to take this easy route because I got to move on to the next patient. Right. So they're not giving what they know truly in their heart many times is in your best interest. But you'd never know that. It, it's, you're right. It's even more insidious than that because the recommendations that get codified into, you know, what your average internist thinks is the quote, what, what are the recommendations say for mammogram? Well, the recommendations for mammograms used to be every year after age 40. Okay. That was it. Every, you get a mammogram every year. After, all of a sudden, a few years ago, it changed to every other year after age 50 and nothing after age 70. Well, was that based on some new um, scientific study? No, that was based on an actuarial study, a financial study run by the insurance companies who said, yes, X number of women will die, but it's worth it because we will save this many bazillions of dollars by not doing other mammograms. That then becomes the quote recommendation. So now Dr. Smith, you go see Dr. Smith and Dr. Smith says, no, Kelly, you don't need a mammogram. It's every other year. You don't need one this year. Well, mm -hmm. based on what? Based on not what's best for me in, in my medical care, it's based, it's what the insurance company decided. So the big issue is that the recommendations that you then believe that you as a patient believe are based on science is most of them aren't based on science. Most of them are based Not on only that. financial drivers. Yep. Yep. Uh, listen, you guys don't have the experience of being in the psychiatric setting, which I did for 30 years mm -hmm. and the egregious mm -hmm. excesses of what, what, uh, I mean, I could tell you stories about how insurances ran the show in, in a psychiatric hospital that was killed. It mm -hmm. routinely killed people. Mm -hmm. And their position was, uh, well, we don't practice medicine. Look, there's Dr. Pinsky or Dr. Smith's, you know, his signature right there on the discharge form. We, we didn't make him discharge the patient. Of course they made them. They, they, there was no right. more resources available, even though the doctor is saying this guy's going to kill himself. He needs another week in the hospital. They're like, no. No, sorry. And th that, that right. happened more. And by the way, when I would make complaints then to the insurance commissioner, the insurance company would go, oh, Dr. Pinsky, you seem to have concerns about our business practices. I'll tell you what, we'll decertify you. In fact, we'll decertify the entire hospital. That's mm -hmm. the game they play. Right. No, it's, it's, it's real. Yes, it is. Yeah. It, tell me, um, uh, you came to this, obviously, you know, most recently you've gone through this experience, uh, Michael, with regard to the uh, the attacks against you and sort of coming to this. You obviously, you said you have a long history. You really grew up with sort of the holistic or naturopathic side of you. What's your experience? What, what was it during your training with regard to your colleagues? Were, were you, do, your, do you think, did your colleagues have sort of the same inkling that you did um, that, that things weren't necessarily, uh, I don't know, as, as uh, transparent as they should be? Or are you the only one? No, yeah. I, I was swimming against the grain, right? I was I swimming bet. upstream. 
Yeah, to with my lateralistic focus, you know, we'd be on rounds. I'll never forget. Let's say we're on uh, internal medicine rounds as a patient with C. diff, right? And, you know, you talk about these heavy drugs that you might give the patient. C. diff is uh, colitis, toxic bacterial infection, right? And you're like, oh, well, we could give them vancomycin, this and that. And I'm like, what about probiotics? You know, I'm pretty sure <laughs> probiotics would be some good, right? But you, you get looked at like you have three eyes if you talk about probiotics, right. you know, on rounds. It's just like, oh, here's the vancomycin dosing regimen, this and that. So I learned to keep my mouth and shut on some of these things. Oh, uh, yeah. didn't stool, stool transfer come from regenerative medicine too? I mean, that became the standard of care. So later on, right. So later on, the idea of, of, of probiotics, Saccharomyces boulardia, for example, I actually heard that on rounds from one of the progressive attendings towards the end. He's like, uh, yeah, we're going to give this patient some Saccharomyces. This has some help to recolonize their colon and then stool transplant. So that started to come in a bit. Yes. Um, but I, I was kind of swimming against this current, you know, in many cases on this stuff. Mm -hmm. And it hits the medical field later, as I said, like vitamin D being an example, it kind of is slow to sweep through there. Um, but, you know, not only is it the question of realizing in medicine, everything we're learning is not the entire truth. And it's not even the entire best way to take care of a patient. There's a whole world of alternative things out there that are actually very helpful and very evidence based. We're just not being told it. That's one thing. And that's true. But apart from that, we didn't realize the extent of the influence to which our minds were uh, shaped right. by the whole idea of evidence-based medicine, shaking down from the journals and the influence of pharma and all that. And I just want to make this point and then open it up for dialogue, especially with you, Dr. Drew and Dr. Kelly, um, to speak further on this. But if you think about it, let's think about it from the side of the pharmaceutical company for a second. Okay, They've got a real problem. The pharmaceutical companies have a real problem because first of all, they spend tens of millions of dollars and many, many years of R&D to come up with this product, but they can't bring the product to market until they first pass a major regulatory hurdle called the FDA. They've got to present their mm -hmm. data. The FDA has got to clear it. Okay. So this is their first hurdle. You can do a bunch of pro uh, product development and it can die because it doesn't pass FDA clearance. Now, once you get through this onerous regulatory agency, guess what? You don't have any physical means of getting the product to your customer. Mm -hmm. You don't. That's called the pharmacy. So now you have a whole nother layer of people you'd have to depend on to try to get your product in the hands of the customer. Guess what? You don't have a sales team that can interact directly with the customer, right? You're, the customer, mm -hmm. aka the patient, has to go find some third party, aka the doctor, to perhaps write a prescription for your product. So you don't even have a sales force that can directly reach out and touch the customer. And besides all that, their fourth existential problem is your product is so overpriced that most patients can't afford it. Therefore, they have to rely on financing that you have no control over, aka the insurance company, right? So you're leaving a part out. You're leaving one part out, which is that, which is that because of patent laws, the moment they take the drug off the shelf and identify it, the clock begins ticking. And they have, what is it, 15 years now to make their profit right. back. And it takes an average of $1.2 billion to get through the FDA and five to seven right. years. And so now you have eight years to make your profit. That's it. And so yes. the, who does, this is another part of your story, right. how we fund phase three trials. This is Harvey Reich's thing and how we construct them and how we do them. Yeah, maybe big data is going to solve some of these problems, but how, you know, who is is funding the phase three trial? Only pharma has enough money to do that. It, and only and things that are going to give them profits at the other end. So regenerative things don't get on the, get on the uh, radar at all. No, and unless we no. disarticulate big pharma from all of this, that's what I was going to, you've come full circle to exactly where I wanted to, to be. All Some of the things that you refer to as alternative um, you know, medicine, things like vitamin D or ivermectin, really aren't alternative at all. If you actually look at the studies that have been done on them, if you were actually able to find the studies, we have known, apparently somebody has known, for decades, that vitamin D fundamentally was the strongest anti-cancer agent we have, not just for prostate cancer, Drew, but for all kinds of cancers. It is the wow. it is the item, it is the it is the thing that the pharmaceutical companies don't want you to know about because vitamin because nobody can make money off of vitamin D. So I would yep. submit to you that it's not that these things are alternative, it's that the information has been 
actively suppressed because you really have to, you know, how do you get to it? It's not showing up in the journals. They're not talking about ivermectin. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until I had a dog, literally a Labrador retriever that had breast cancer that I found out that ivermectin has been known to be highly effective against breast cancer for decades, decades. Yep. Okay. There are yep. studies, studies that you mean, Dr. Turner, you've seen them. Uh, you, you and I have swapped them back and forth. These aren't new studies. This is stuff that the NIH has known for decades, that the FDA has known for decades, the CDC has known for decades. They have actively suppressed it. And this has to do with really talk about agency capture. How do we get the pharmaceutical companies the heck out of the practice of medicine? Right. I, I, I don't know exactly how we begin to do that. We're going to have to have some smarter minds on it than mine. But to illustrate that point, you know, a company is going to do what a company is going to do, right? And they, they, they exist to make a profit and to stay alive. And it's a dog eat dog mm -hmm. world, right? Mm -hmm. So they've got those four barriers existentially to even getting their product into the hands of the customer, maybe a fifth one, as Drew was mentioning. So what are they going to do? They're going to exert all possible means to control that process at every right. step of the way. They're going to exert all possible means to control and influence the FDA and the pharmacists and the providers who write the scripts and the insurance companies and anybody else who stands in their way. They've got to, right? It's like, it's like if you were Ford Motor Company, but you know, you couldn't have your own showroom, nor sales force, nor in-house financing. You got to depend on other <laughs> groups. Well, you're <laughs> right. to stay alive, you're going to figure out how to influence and control those other groups. And that was my point. I never realized quite how much I was controlled in my education by hearing and understanding right. just what pharma had dictated through the journals, et cetera, um, because I was being shaped essentially to be that direct-to-consumer salesperson for pharma, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. unspoken in some senses, in some cases more overt, but that's what it is. We're the, we're the ultimate sales force that has to touch the consumer directly. They depend on us. So they figure out how to influence us. You can bet they do. And we need to make uh, other healthcare providers aware of that and uh, get them to be breaking free. No, I, I agree with you. And I think that, you know, Drew and I have talked about this in a lot of different, taken a lot of different approaches to this, the uh, the capture of what, what I call our storied medical journals. I always prided myself in being, you know, that physician who actually went to the Lancet and went to JAMA and went to the you know, BMJ and read yep. the article, uh, read the study. And now I feel sort of like an idiot because it turns out what I was reading was fundamentally, you know, propaganda. Uh, much of it was, was really um, the vast majority of it funded by pharmaceutical companies. Uh, it's hard to find that out. It's really hard sometimes to understand the conflicts of interest. They're not readily apparent. Even when you read the conflicts at the end, you know, sometimes there's so many layers, it's hard to actually know who funded the study, for example. And so somehow we have got to retake the, uh, you know, rebuild the integrity of the scientific process within medicine, because as long as it's funded largely by um, a big corporation, i.e. big pharma, you, you can't trust. I mean, he, you know, I don't know who it was who said, I think it was Joseph Fryman who said, you know, when I when I buy a Samsung television, you know, I, I don't read the reviews that are written by Samsung. You know, I, 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 I try to read, you know, I, it's, it's, it's that that's kind good. of, it's, but, I, but that's what I, it is, gonna, you know, when you I'm read it, an, an article. A little bit. I want okay. to push back a little bit and say that that you know I I don't want to vilify pharmaceutical companies they, they, as by the same token as they do whatever they have to do. I know, I know, it's okay. I'm not going to vilify you for doing so either. But 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 it's I I have I have had the benefit of many medications and I've used both personally as a patient and uh, for my family and my patients that there's been remarkable advances that pharmaceuticals have brought us and that I've been able to use. And after all, as someone who's not using a scalpel all day, all I have is physiology and pharmacology to, well, I have a couple of things I can do too, but you, you have, I'm trying to adjust very powerful biology, mm -hmm. biology sometimes. And sometimes things have gotten away from us and we have very, very, very mm -hmm. sick people in front of us. And there's some good studies out there that have, yeah, I think we have to have a jaundiced eye when we look at these studies. I also am, am pushed back on the idea that pharmacy 
actively suppress this thing. I I think the editorial process is where things have gone off the rail. And so we're just not seeing the full range of, of data that we should be seeing, uh, both positive and negative on pharmaceuticals and on non-pharmaceutical interventions and you know readily available molecules that don't make anybody money. The, the editorial process, I think, is where things have gone way, way sideways. Because you know, as you and I know, Kelly, we've we've seen studies that took they were excellent, took two years to come to a journal, and the majors turned them down. And that there's something wrong there. Everything goes just in one direction, and yeah, that that's a problem. We have to undo that, whether it's using RICO laws or like RFK Jr. says, or just exerting the pressure as a community. We have to we have to get that improved. But we, it's remarkable that things are as good as they are, I guess is what I'm saying, given all these outside forces that are, are, um, have, can potentially adulterate things. Dr. Turner, thoughts on that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm, I, I can see where Drew is coming from with that. Um, pharmaceutical companies aren't in, entirely evil. I'm not trying to say that. I'm thankful for certain meds. I prescribe certain meds at the time. Obviously, ivermectin is a medication. It was developed and brought to market by a pharmaceutical company. So I'm thankful for that. Um, you know, we have to realize the limitations and we have to be able to have an honest dialogue more than anything. Uh, I'll use the vaccines as an yeah. example, right? Why can't we just have an honest dialogue about the pros and the cons of this new medical technology, right? If this were some new cardiac stent that came out on the market and a couple years in, we found serious death signals and had cause for concern, we should be able to have an honest dialogue about the pros and cons and allow for informed consent. And if these things are terrible, let them be pulled from the market. But as soon as we try to discuss that as regards the vaccine, it's verboten and somehow we're silenced, right? So that's that's unacceptable. Anything that pharma wants to bring needs to be subject to the light of day and scientific scrutiny, just like anything else. And there needs to be some independent funding yes. mechanisms, right, for all so-called alternative treatments so that they can develop uh, an evidence base that's as robust. Again, you know, yes. some ivermectin, right, certain things are not studied because they, they lack a sugar daddy, essentially. They don't have someone to bank Correct. them through this Correct. process. Correct. It, it, right. So where's our public health money that's funding that stuff that's truly in the people's interest? Right. And so where, where I would push back on what you said, Drew, is that when you say, you know, the problem isn't the pharmaceutical companies, it's the editorial process. Well, the, the pharmaceutical companies control the editorial process. Yes, just yes. Just like they control no, no, I get mainstream it. I get media. That. You know, when you're yeah. Fox no, News, I get it. 80% of your advertising revenue comes from pharmaceutical companies, you are going to promote what they tell you to. It's the same thing with the Lancet or the BMJ or, or you know, any JAMA. They are owned by the pharmaceutical companies. So if, the pharma if, if Pfizer says, don't publish that study, uh, Lancet's not going to publish that study. Or they say, do publish this one. I mean, I hate to tell you, but that's how it works. So I'm simply suggesting that we need a an independence or something that is not owned by big pharma, that is not owned, um, yeah. you know, by somebody who has who have has a vested financial interest. Um, and I have said many times that if somebody died and made me queen, I would make every article that appeared, uh, any study that appeared, that before the title of the article, they should say who pays for this, who is, you know, who yes. actually funded this study that should be disclosed upfront so that it's very, very easy uh, in my mind for the, for the reader to understand who funded this study and therefore help you to understand what the conflicts might be. Because right yeah. now it's, it's I, I absolutely so agree. I agree with that. Yep. I agree with that. I just, yeah, I just good. want people to understand that, you know, we get, we get into, we, the world gets into this, all good, all bad kind of thinking. It's like, it, it's it's the excesses. It's the things that have gone too far that we're right. talking about. We're not saying dismantle everything. We're saying there's, we, we got to come up with alternative practices, alternative comp competing systems, right. alternative ways of doing this. 
because things have gone too far in a certain direction where it has adulterated the system, I think. No, well, and, guys, and I uh, write a lot of pres- I write a lot of prescriptions, by the way. I don't, you know, I'm not just, you know, of course. suggesting, you know, of eye course. of newt and wing of bat. You know, I, I actually right. write a lot of, <laughs> right. I write a That's lot of point. prescriptions. That's my point. That's my point. It's all that we I'm have. It's, we don't use a scalpel, the three of us. We don't, we you know, use okay. chemicals to, sh- to shift physiology. And some of it I has a natural, sometimes. you know, <laughs> say, well, you, you get to work in the ER. We're not working <laughs> in that setting so much. I have a, uh, a question. But, but what's yes. Kelly? But, I, I, Caleb, yeah. Caleb. Yeah. So, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not advocating for this, but I think that the natural next question that some people might have is what if we take all money out of health entirely with some sort of a universal healthcare system? Is that, how does that solve or not solve this problem with money being so involved in our health? It, it, I will say one thing with that is a a how do you you think the you, let's put it this way go to building and safety or the DMV and you want those people running your healthcare <laughs> system right. that right. that's what hey. that's what you're going to have and that's they're going to be tightening Correct. it down and restricting access it's going to be a catastrophe now if you want to have that as one system within other systems I have no problem with that I, in fact I think that's a good idea but if everybody goes into it. You're going to rue the day. You're going to hate it. My, yeah. And yeah, I would say something similar, which is what happens then, Caleb, with universal health care is twice as much money actually gets spent, but all of it becomes administrative yeah. and very little of it trickles yes, down to the people. Right. Uh, yeah, very exactly. little of that's it gets right. spent actually on health care. Uh, it's all administrative, becomes very bureaucratic and uh, the, you know, the implementation of it and the bureaucracy. Government's involvement in anything has never made something more efficient or cheaper. I guess it's in the history of the best unit. Your best unit, Caleb. Your best unit is the patient and the physician, or the practitioner and the and the patient. You put anything on top of that, you create inefficiency immediately. Anything, every single thing you add to that relationship, you're making it less efficient. So we're talking about getting it back to the patients and the practitioners, and letting them sort of operate as individual units. uh, And you can do it. You can do it for so much less. It's just so ridiculous. Ridiculous. I guess it's, people don't understand that. It's probably similar to how, like, whenever I was in the hospital, you know, one Tylenol there suddenly cost ten dollars because of all the bureaucracy right. and the red That's tape. The insurance and companies, you know, exactly. That's yeah, the insurance yeah. So companies. It, the that. prices will cost way more. Yes, way yeah. more. Uh, it, all right, we're down against the clock here, wait. Dr. Turner. Thank. Any last, any last thoughts here? We we have whirlwinded you. We've <laughs> we ping ponged <laughs> back and forth. Uh, like. <laughs> What else would you like uh, well, to get I've, in there? I've greatly enjoyed the conversation. Thank you both very much for having me. It was engaging. Um, and I always want to end on a note of optimism and positivity because I think that's warranted, actually. You know, there's an awakening going on. There's a lot of momentum, grassroots. It cuts across political spectrum. It cuts across left coast, you know, west coast, east coast. It doesn't matter. These are yep. people and providers waking up to some really fundamental basic questions. I want to be able to trust my healthcare provider. I want autonomy over what goes in my body. I want true informed consent. I want access to the best treatments. I don't want other layers interfering with me getting good healthcare. So let's keep moving together. Let's lock arms. Let's have a reformation of our healthcare system and leave this thing looking better in 10 years than it is today. We've all got kids and grandkids and we're all going to get old and need this system at one point as well. So let's keep working hard to make it better. I'm all for it. Amen. Yep. I can, Amen. I and God agree. bless it's, you. It's I, great... I, tr- I truly, I appreciate your, your courage, uh, your leadership on this. I really do. I know you've been under the gun and I think what you're doing is tremendous. Uh, you've got a, a little more time to, uh, to be doing this than Drew and I do. So, uh, but, but I am all in, I think you're hundred percent right. Let's lock arms and let's fix this thing because I think we can, I think we can, and I'm with you. So God bless. I agree. Indeed. Thank you, Dr. Turner. Hope we'll talk soon. All right. Thank there. you so Kelly, much. Kelly, okay. for you and I, you got it. Uh, we have Carrie Lake coming in here tomorrow. Next week uh, is Baby Week. Uh, there are no <laughs> oh, shows right. Baby Nation. that week. Uh, <laughs> Baby Nation. There she is. Uh, then on the first, second, and third, we were going to do some caller shows. Um, yep. Kelly, you're certainly welcome to join me on those. I think that'd be fun, actually. On the Is that okay with you, Caleb, if she joins uh, me on the Wednesday? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Terrific. And, uh, just Good, terrific. Terrific. Get up there, but I'm... Is that okay everybody. with you, Big Daddy? <laughs> <laughs> oh, gee. I'm about to be a father of two. It's really, it's actually starting to sink in now, now that I have seven days left. 
It's finally yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. It's a calm before the storm. Yeah. Enjoy it. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we also it's have gonna a toddler, be a one, so, one on yeah. one. Yeah, one on one defense. That's that's all right. You're, you guys, you go to one on one now. Right. Well, I just know. How about, exactly how about right. from zero to three, like I did? Oh, just think yeah, about we that. Were, yeah, we were always in a we were always in a zone, oh, yeah. and we were always out. Then you're then you got to go yeah. to the yeah, zone you won't defense. Sleep much. <laughs> oh, I, yeah. I, 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 yeah. I can, I can no, never, never talk about our pregnancy because you you guys already went through triplets all at once. I just want to remind Sorry, the. I have empathy, though. I do. I do. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, you, you, I know. You guys have been, you guys have made this much easier than it, <laughs> as easy as you could. I just want to remind the viewers also that those three caller shows, the first one on November 1st, it's all about COVID and medical freedom topics. Then on November 2nd, it's going to be anything but COVID. So all the questions oh, like that people that. haven't been able to ask, they can come in and ask it on that show. Then on November 3rd, yeah. it's callers on any topic, anything you want to talk about. We're just, Fill in that week with caller shows. So we're off the 30, 30th too, right? Hang or on I thought a second, guys. I tried to get yes, that. Yes, we're, we're looking off. at those dates. That that's that seems a little off to me in terms of the dates. Uh, are uh, the third try to Monday. get a Monday show in. We'll yeah. talk later this month. We'll yeah, later. definitely, we'll definitely the first and second for sure. We are doing that here, for here. sure. The third's Sorry. fine too. Here's our traditional. We're flying Friday. Rearrange so the calendar. We're good. At the end of Don't the do show. it now, Drew. We gotta. We gotta tape an ad. So I gotta go. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll figure, we'll keep posted. We'll keep you all, all posted. Right. And uh, Kelly, Bye. thanks so much. See you next week. Okay. All right. Oh, Bye. no, the week after next. Ta ta. Take care. Bye. Uh, for Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources at drdrew.com slash help. Did I describe my reaction, my lightweight reaction to you guys on this show? Uh, yeah, is that yeah. when you smoked and yes. then you had like a panic attack, right? It was not a panic attack. I had what's called an anticholinergic delirium. Mm. I actually had no, I had no anxiety Boy. at all. Because I, I, I was very cool about it, given how miserable I was. So wait, and what? I had no high. I was just miserable. I, I um, took two hits with some of the cool kids, and I developed... I looked like you. That's rough, bro. And I kid you not... The greater the financial interests in a given field, the less likely the research findings are to be true. Wow. The world that the greedy want to create, all of natural resources in their hands, all of land in their hands. The same billionaires who are telling the farmers, forget the land, take money and leave it, want that land. The same people who say, oh, food is unnecessary, we're going to make lab food, are the very people who are then also investing in land to have real food so many of these different government agencies and how they are involved with our life and where they have gone off the rail by involving themselves with these corrupting influences uh, this merger of state and corporate power where the companies that are in industries that are being regulated are capturing the agencies that are supposed to regulate them and turning them into predatory organisms against the american people 